My name is Sophie Millman. The event is brought to you by a small group of very engaged women, Dorit Smali, Bailey Roth, Samantha Rosen, Michelle Garber, Tamara Niazov, Leanne Godkind, and me. I want to thank our many individual donors. Without your support, we wouldn't be here tonight. I also want to acknowledge our charity partners, B'nai B'rith and One Family Fund. Thank you so much for all the work you do. You might be wondering why we're all here to talk about extremism. After all, Canada is a Western country. It's a liberal democracy. We are safe. We have rights. However, the answer to the question of why we're all here is on a full display on Canadian streets right now, every weekend, on our campuses, at our schools. We see that during school walkouts. It's on our politics and in our policies. It's captured in marches and protests by hundreds of thousands of people in major North American cities and Western cities. It's captured also in flag desecration and chants vilifying the West and calling for intifada, which means uprising, or jihad, which can mean holy war. Right-thinking people everywhere deplore the human cost of this war, including the cost to the many innocent civilians of Gaza. And yet, there have been many foreign wars and conflicts over the past decade. None of them have elicited this kind of reaction in Canada and elsewhere in the West with open calls for revolution. To quote Hannah Arndt, the ideal subject for totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction no longer exists. The people who get their history in geopolitics from TikTok are too young to remember 9-11. 19 men with box cutters wreaked havoc on U.S. soil and U.S. air, killing thousands indiscriminately. Jews, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, Zoroastrians. They did not check ID for religion, gender, or age. On 9-11, 19 men with box cutters showed us with a very small number of very radicalized people who blame the West for everything that's wrong with their lives can do. The nightmare of October 7th wasn't special just because it happened to Israelis. It was special because it was the only mass murder of civilians that has not been resoundly condemned by the international community, by academics, by rape crisis centers, by the Red Cross, and by the UN. In some quarters, it was celebrated, actually. And in others, there was a lot of equivocation and excuses, as if 1,400 civilians could have deserved it. This war is the only war that caused our streets to flood with hundreds of thousands of protesters calling for violence in Canada and elsewhere in the West. How did we get here? What's the solution? Our speakers will provide their thoughts. Our distinguished keynote for tonight is Mossab Hassan Youssef, the eldest son of Sheikh Hassan Youssef, a co-founder of Hamas. A powerful internal non-conformist streak. I wish we all had one of those. A moral compass led him to reject his birthright. Instead of facilitating terror attacks, the Green Prince worked as part of a counterterrorism team. Instead of risking the lives of others, he risked his own life by fighting terror. Undeterred by the fatwa placed on him, he spent his days trying to wake up the West to what terrorists do to their own people, the Palestinian people, and what their ideologies could do to our society here in Canada if we continue to be too polite to ask uncomfortable questions. And now please welcome Musab Hassan Youssef. Thank you. Please sit down. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome. Standing ovation before we start. No pressure. I really don't know where to begin. I did not think it would be as tense as it is now. People ask, What's your motive? Or what's the turning point? 
the turning point. As there is a, such a thing as the turning point. First of all, I did not leave Hamas yesterday. It has been many, many years. My fight with Hamas started way before I met any Zionist. Since childhood, they tried to repress me. They tried to contain me. They did everything within their ability. Bad things. And they are still trying. We're telling people the danger is spreading. And if we don't eradicate Hamas in Gaza, it's going to go all over the place like wildfire. Much faster than anybody is thinking. It's very different than 20 years ago with all the social media. They are infiltrating schools. They're spreading hatred. If the situation continues to be like this for another year or two, everything will collapse. So many people abused this cause called Palestine, projecting whatever human desire they have through the cause. Beneath the surface, lust, hatred, delusion, anger, violence, then Hamas is just another movement taking advantage of what's so-called Palestine or Palestinian cause. So they come and they say, we are a Palestinian organization and we want to liberate Palestine. Lying. Because what's next on your agenda? Your mother organization, the Muslim Brotherhood, what's your ideology? But it is all in their charter and we can read it. There is no way to rationalize with Hamas. It's a dead end. You cannot convince them. They believe in violence. If the world does not submit to their demand, today they will use violence. And tomorrow when they have more power, they will use more violence. And we are not dealing with a small group of people, a few thousands in Gaza, because Hamas belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood, which nobody is talking about. Look at the media coverage, but no one is talking about the Muslim Brotherhood who has more than 100 million active members worldwide. They are only religious, ideological movement, raging a holy war against Israel and the Jewish people, against the world, because they don't believe in political borders. They want a global state. One state, one race, or let's say at least one religion. No Christianity in it, no Judaism, no Buddhism, no Hinduism, nothing. And everything has to go according Allah and the Islamic constitution. A global state, a lot worse than Nazism. I love the principles of the Western civilization. I think it is the best because it, it believes in diversity. It believes in dialogue. We accept the other. All colors of life is accepted in this society. And that's the best way. And the alternative to this is violence. It's a dead end, destruction, more human suffering. And what we saw on October 7th, that was the peak of their evil. 35 years in the making. And we have to prove them wrong. If we don't prove them wrong today, that their violence is taking them nowhere, we have failed big time. Because it will not be only Hamas. It will be many other groups blackmailing democracies worldwide. We saw the Mexican cartel wearing Hamas outfit, celebrating Hamas. Because when criminals and savages everywhere, they see that one group was able to bring a democracy to its knees. You see all this 
global pressure on Israel to stop now. Cease fire, please. And Hamas so happy about this. This is what they wanted. Legitimacy. That the world is willing to meet with their demands and beg for forgiveness. Forgetting what happened just less than two months ago. What Hamas committed on October 7 was a genocide by all standards. For those who watched the atrocities of Hamas to understand the nature of their attack that was not measured by how many people died on October 7, it was how they died and why they died where Hamas moved from door to door, annihilating everything in their way. 20 communities were wiped out. Women, children, infants, raping, looting, burning, blowing up, then taken hostages. Then Hamas does not stop there. They go back to Gaza, use an entire society as human shields. When Hamas leaders take refuge among their tribes, among their families, what are you expecting from Israel? And Hamas killed many of the cousins. Then Hamas statistics about civilian casualty is not accurate. They are lying. It's a lot less than what they are announcing. And many of the photos that they have, they took them from Syria, years before the Gaza war. And the world doesn't even know the difference. An entire nation fail to condemn the savages. Not even one decent individual stood and said, this does not represent us. Seeing the barbaric attack of Hamas, documented by their own media that is not a propaganda everything was cut on a camera the world failed to condemn hamas for first committing a genocide for second taking human shields to kidnap infants demanding the exchange to release mass murderers in return the United Nations, they failed to condemn Hamas. Russia is given Hamas cover. China is given Hamas cover. It's the wild card that Putin needed to shift the attention from Ukraine to the Middle East, knowing when he ignites a religious war in the Middle East, nobody would think about his moves in Europe and in Africa, trying to change the world order moving through Iran to just destabilize the entire region and drag Israel, the United States, NATO into an ugly war is missing with the global security, with the future of humanity. U.S. campuses, there is increase of the anti-Semitism, blaming Israel, blaming the Jewish people. You take a state, the only true democracy that has so much diversity in, in the Middle East, all type of ethnic groups, Druze, Muslims, Christians, everybody practicing their religion freely, where Arabic is an official language, where are representatives of the Arab community in the parliament, in the Knesset. And you say that this is an apartheid state committing genocide? Who initiated this? What worry me that the university submitted to their pressure. The students, they're just young. They don't know the Middle East. They don't have the power to discern what's going on. This type of forces, they love to thrive in chaos. When there is death, there is war, there is civilian casualties. This is their opportunity to rise, to project their hatred. But they're mistaken because it's not over yet. And we will restore order. We will eradicate Hamas. And we will bring the world back to stability. In this climate, they cannot thrive. They will die. So we can continue our denial. 
and we will be next. It's not that far. All of us can fight evil and nobody has an excuse to sit down and wait for death creeping. If we don't contain it, it is going to go out of control. We will all pay the price for that. Israel is fighting on our behalf in the Middle East. It's my fight. It's your fight. It's the free world fight. And we have to give them whatever it takes all the way until Hamas is eradicated. To put it into the Canadian context, we have an amazing panel for you. And I would like to welcome to the stage our wonderful moderator for the evening, Rahil Raza. Rahil is the president of the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow, president of the Council for Muslims Against Antisemitism. She's a fellow with the McDonald Laurier Institute, award-winning journalist, public speaker, educator, and advocate for human rights. She is the recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal for Service to Canada and accredited with the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva for her work. Rahil, over to you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Sophie. I'd like to invite my distinguished panelists to come up and join me on the stage. Bassam Eid, Asad, Goldie, would you like to come up and take a seat? Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My mind is still reeling from Masab's talk. I'm sure yours is too. It's a tragedy of October 7th. We know beyond a doubt, especially after hearing Mossab, who carried out this murder and mayhem and under whose instructions. You will hear all about their agenda from our speakers. What is clear is that this is not just a Jewish problem. You all know what starts with the Jews never ends with the Jews. You will notice that we are all here from diverse communities. What is happening is our problem, yours and mine. For, for we've seen it unfold on our streets in the most heinous ways. So let's own it. As Canadians, we have to ask ourselves the question, why is the turbulence in the Middle East creating havoc on the streets of Canada? I'll tell you why, because this is the result of a well-crafted strategy cleverly planned over many years. If these rallies were really about human rights, and as Sophie said so correctly, let's ask, why aren't they rallying against China's genocide of the Uyghurs, the mass killings in Yemen due to the war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, massacre by the Assad regime in, in Syria, and the list goes on you can buy into the anti-Semitic version funded by Iran and its proxies, which has more holes than a fishing net, or you can absorb the facts you hear today. When we speak about the truth, the person who unravels this best is Basim Eid. Basim is a Jerusalem-based political analyst, human rights pioneer, and expert commentator in Arab and Palestinian affairs. Eid assumed the role of chairman in 2016 of the Center for Near East Policy Research. In response to the deterioration of human rights situation under the Palestinian Authority, Eid founded the Palestinian Human Rights Monitoring Group, which mon monitors abuses committed by the PA and also deals to some extent with Israel. Eid has spent 26 years researching UNRWA policies, and has written extensively on the subject of UNRWA reform. He is also an outspoken cri critic of the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, otherwise known as BDS. Europe never ever fallen in love with the Palestinians. But Europe is using the Palestinians against Israel. It's very clear right now. I think that the West is one of the major reasons 
why the Islamic extremism is spreading around the world. Look what the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, did in Iraq. He flee from Iraq and he offered the Iraq on a golden plate, a tray to the Iranians. Look to the current president, Biden. He flee from Afghanistan and he offered it on a golden tray to Taliban. What you are expecting then? What are you expecting after that? You should have to expect terror. You should have to expect only terror. And I think that the only one right now who is dancing on the bloodshed in the Middle East are two people, the Iranians and Putin. This butcher, Ibrahim Raisi, couldn't sleep at night unless you will hear how many hundreds of Palestinians has been killed in Gaza. This is what the Palestinians getting from the Iranians. Brutal terrorist, barbaric organization like the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. This is the brotherhood movement. This is the exactly the mission of the, the, the brotherhood movement. How to grow up more and more in the West. Nobody mentioned the entire war right now between the Muslims themselves, the Sunnis and the Shia. This is a real war right now taking place, which Iran, by the way, is a part of it. Look in Pakistan. They are exploding most during the Friday break, while thousands of people are inside. Once it's done by the Shia, and the second Friday done by the Sunnis. This is the real threat. And everything is coming out of Iran. Even that the Islamic Brotherhood movement is a Sunni, but in the meantime, the Iranians has no objection to be their friends. Because the agenda is much more important than the religion for the Iranians. And if the agenda is to concentrate on Israel and to fight Israel, let's go ahead with it. They are very happy to spend a lot of money in that. So where is the West? Where is the West? The Islamic Brotherhood movement is growing slowly, slowly in many Western countries right now. These people even became so rich. I don't know from where they are getting their funding and their aid. And they are supporting. And they are donating a lot of money for terrorist organizations. The former president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, after they arrested him, you know what they found in Sudan? They found that the Hamas already invested in Sudan five billion dollars in hotels, in restaurants, in biggest apartments. Hamas investing money in Sudan. Why they invested in Sudan? Because Omar al Bashir is also a member of the Islamic Brotherhood movement, like the Hamas and like the Islamic Jihad. Qatar is another story, which I don't know why the world is keeping so silence on the terror that Qatar is also spreading around the world. They are supporting the Islamic Brotherhood. Nobody is mentioning Turkey. Turkey also supporting terror of the Islamic movement. And their people are starving in Gaza. Their people are without shelter, 
under this war. Thank you so much, Basim. To speak to the issue of hatred across university campuses and the virulent anti-Western propaganda, I'm going to invite a young man who's lived it personally and will share his story. Assad Sam Hanna is an American Syrian activist in the field of counterterrorism and rad de-radicalization. Hanna is an advisor to the Lobo Institute, which works in different countries on de-radicalization and disarming children. Before that, he worked with various organizations in the MENA region and in the U.S. He is going to speak about his personal journey and the climate at Ivy League universities, plus he will address the issue of follow the money. Sam. The organization I work with, we help 130,000 people. We rescued them from under the rubbles, and that's the reason why we were nominated for Nobel Peace Award twice. It struck me that the first time I had to deal with the IDF was when we were working on rescuing group of our own volunteers who, who were rescuing people in southern Syria on the borders with Israel. And the Iranian forces, the, the IRGC, advancing on the ground, we got trapped in a very small area. And we know if the IRGC will reach us, they will just behead every one of us, every single one of us. They did that in many places. Jordan refused to open the borders for our volunteers. The IDF helped us to rescue our own volunteers from the IRGC forces, and they moved them through the Golan Heights, and then they moved them to, to, to Jordan to a camp there. I stayed working on the ground until 2020, and then I was accepted in Columbia University in New York. And I was happy I'm coming to, to be in Ivy League. I was so surprised that people in Ivy League, they don't know what real life is. They think the UN is the one who's going to solve all the world problem. They believe that the theories in book applicable in real life more than what's happening really on the ground. You give them facts, you give them numbers, you give them real statements from people on the ground saying that's what's happening. They refuse it. They, they blind their own students because they don't want them to see the reality. And if you look on all the professors of the Ivy League University, they are from one kind, one background, one method of teaching. As example, about who is influencing universities, who is influencing students. The special envoy from the U.S. government to Iran, his security clearance was frozen a couple of months ago because he shared confidential information with, with the Islamic regime in the neg negotiation in Austria. They found out and they froze his security clearance because he's damaging the national security of the U.S. He's still under investigation by the FBI, but what happened? He lost his job. So Princeton University, the Ivy League, offered him an uh, honorary seat to, to lead the teaching about political science. That's the person who shared confidential information, classified information from the U.S. national security with the Islamic regime of Iran. Princeton gives him honorary seat to be teaching students. And that just shows you who is influencing students. Another thing to look at, as Rahil mentioned, follow the money. Guys, the Muslim Brotherhood, in the last couple of years, they invested $4.7 billion in Ivy Leagues, only in the U.S., $4.7 billion. That much money, they can build their own Ivy Leagues. They can build the best institution, $4.7 billion. But they don't. They want to influence what the West has. They want to influence Canada, what the U.S., what Europe has. They don't want to compete with the good. They want to change the good to be bad. They want to change the good to be serving their own purposes. Those who are organizing marches in the streets, they are getting a lot of donations from Qatari, from a Muslim Brotherhood organization, like millions of dollars after the first two weeks was funneled through those organizations. None of those organizations are saying we want to save civilians on both sides. Who are the puppet masters that fund and support all the hate we see around us? Why is there foreign funding coming into our mosques, educational institutions, and Muslim organizations? Did all this happen overnight? No. This has been in the making for years. And let me remind you, warning bells were sounded. But is anyone listening? To connect these dots in detail, we have with us MPP Goldie Gamari. Goldie Gamari is the first Iranian-Canadian woman to be elected to office. 
She is a member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, representing Carlton. She serves as the chair of the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. MPP Gamari also works tirelessly with a coalition of politicians and human rights activists to raise awareness about the sponsorship networks for terror on Canadian soil with the Iranian Islamic State and IRGC at their core, and she advocates for the liberation of the people of Iran. The people of Iran have been fighting for 44 years to free themselves from the terrorist and illegitimate Islamic regime. This is the same Islamic regime that has founded, funded, armed, and trained Hamas. The same terrorist and illegitimate Islamic regime that spreads anti-Semitism and denies the Holocaust. If we want to fight terrorism, if we want to fight the root cause of evil, we need to recognize it for what it is. There is a large and powerful pro-Islamic regime lobby group, not just Iranians, but reporters from all nationalities and all ethnicities, and they spread these lies and this misinformation. And why do they do this? They do this because they are Islamic regime apologists. They want to keep the terrorist and illegitimate Islamic regime in power by trying to say that they are nice and they want to reform and they just want to live with everyone else. And that is not the case at all. These people are terrorists. You cannot negotiate with them. Just a few days ago, they executed a 16-year-old boy, a 16-year-old Iranian boy. They hanged him. The crime doesn't matter because they make up fake crimes. In fact, they execute Iranians under the crime of corruption against God, whatever that means. We are talking about an Islamo-fascist regime. And what's even more frustrating for Iranians is that we have been sounding the alarm for years, for years, and no one has taken us seriously because no one thought that our concern was Canada's concern. But I'm here to tell you that it is not just the problem of Iranian Canadians, but it's your problem because Canada has become a safe haven for the terrorist and illegitimate Islamic regime in Iran. Just a few weeks ago, a global news report came out by an Iranian Canadian journalist, Nigar Mojtahidi. She did a whole year-long special report investigation. There are over 700 people affiliated with a terrorist and illegitimate Islamic regime in Iran who live in Canada. These are people who have executed Iranians. These are people who support terrorism, and they live here. My parents immigrated to Canada in 1986 because they wanted to get away from terrorism. They wanted to get away from Islamofascism. They wanted to live in a free and democratic society. And now we are seeing them here. And it is terrifying. They are targeting us. Not only are they targeting us, you're seeing what's happening in the streets. The root cause of terrorism, the root cause of anti-Semitism, the Holocaust denying Ayatollahs spread this message, not just within the Islamic regime in Iran, not just in the Middle East, but around the world. But let me tell you something, together we are united, we will fight terrorism, and we will make sure to bring peace back because this war is our war and we are in it together. Thank you. Thank you, Goldie. Thank you so much. We have a few questions from the audience. So, Basim, this is for you. Uh, if you want to pick up the mic. What's being taught in schools in countries that surround Israel about Jews and the West? How is the West viewed through the eyes of Palestinian, Jordanian, and Syrian children? The West are the major donors to the Palestinian textbooks and the Palestinian curriculum. The West knows 
that those textbooks and that curriculum is full of violence and hatred towards Jews. Personally, I appeared in front of the EU in Brussels. I met with 28 different parliamentarians over there. I explained to them what's really going on. I even translated some of the textbooks to English to make it easier for them to understand what is going on. Everybody in that time told me it's really horrible and we should have to do something. But what has been done since probably eight years ago until today, I think zero thing. And they still continue supporting, by the way, the Palestinian judicial system, the Palestinian curriculum, and the textbooks. And this is another subject which has been dealt recently, Israel, Egypt, United States, and Europe. When they start talking about what's after the war, I think that Israel raised the issue of the textbooks also. Not only the security of Gaza, not only who is going to control Gaza, but also the issue of the textbooks has been raised by the Israelis. I hope that really after the war, the international community, including Israel, will start focusing more and more seriously towards the, the, the curriculum and the textbooks, because I am a person who believes that peace starts from the schools. Okay, Basit. It's one thing to give your message to an audience outside the West Bank and Gaza. How do you give the same message to Palestinians? How do you talk about these issues with people in the West Bank? I have to tell you that from 2000 till 2014, 14 years, I used to appear on a live program on the Israeli TV in Arabic, not in English, not in Hebrew. And that's a weekly program, live program, that three Palestinians with another Jewish guy sitting and talking about the current situation. What I already said in English here and everywhere, I already repeated for millions of times in Arabic. And when I used to travel to some other cities next day, people coming to me and saying, you was wonderful yesterday night. People knows exactly what's really going on. Much better than myself, by the way. Because I'm getting my information from the people directly. What they are feeling, what they are thinking, what they are expecting. And people talking. When I want to talk to them, they are talking. But when any foreigner coming to them, people are feeling so scared or they don't want to talk, or people will start lying when they are talking. Thank you. Thank you, Basim. Question to you, Asad. How can we look at the situation in universities, educational institutions? I think everyone has a responsibility, starting from, from the uh, kindergarten to the universities, the Ivy League. Question the university and the schools on their curriculum. Our problem is also the politicians. We see people like Alhan Omar, Rashid Atleib, AOC, who are leading voices against the Israelis, against the Jewish people, supporting Hamas, supporting sending money to Hamas. And the U.S. used to have a lot of restrictions on money, blundering money or investing for the IRGC regime or the uh, Hamas organizations. But recently, in the last two years, we have seen a lot of restrictions being removed, and that gave the Islamic regime a lot of access to money. The massacre happened in Israel just two weeks after the U.S. government gave them access to $6 billion in offshore and U.S. accounts. So don't tell me this money will be used for fixing streets and electricity. Money which is supposed to go to fixing streets will be sent to Hamas, to Gaza, to, to kill people. I have a question for you, Goldie. This is from... Rizwan Mohammed, a seasoned journalist and a political commentator. And his question is, why is there such a strong media bias in Canada? 
I know there was a story that came out just after the October 7 genocidal massacre by the Hamas terrorists, where I guess there was an internal memo by CBC News saying that uh, you cannot label Hamas as terrorists. And that was very shocking to me. Hamas is a listed terror entity in Canada. So I really don't understand why the CBC, which is a state-funded media outlet, I just, as a Canadian citizen, I just don't understand why there would be a memo saying do not refer to them as terrorists when it, they're listed as a terrorist entity on the Canadian terror list. What Sam said about the $6 billion going to the Islamic regime in Iran is really important because the Islamic regime also has a huge propaganda network. And this ties into the media bias. We're talking about the Quds News Network, which is literally a Hamas propaganda mouthpiece that's funded by the terrorist Islamic regime in Iran. We're also talking about Al Jazeera, the mouthpiece for the Qatari foreign intelligence. Al Jazeera also has AJ+, Plus, the sort of younger version of Al Jazeera, which is geared towards the younger generation, the Gen Z, the youth, the, maybe the younger millennials. And a lot of the ideology we're seeing in universities and campuses comes from AJ+, Plus and it goes back to the funding and how Qatar and the Islamic regime funds its propaganda network. The Islamic regime has a ministry specifically dedicated to the cyber army and the propaganda it does around the world. It's very sophisticated, but it's very concerning when I see Western journalists who didn't know anything about the Middle East before October 7, all of a sudden they've become MENA experts and they're retweeting Al Jazeera or they're retweeting the Quds News Network. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what is happening right now? Like, why are these reporters aren't actually looking into the origins of Al Jazeera or the Quds News Network? And, and why are they actually relying on this as news? We saw what happened with the hospital when it was the Islamic Jihad group that their rocket failed and their rocket fell on that hospital. And yet, as soon as the Hamas News Network came out and said it was Israel, the media believed in it. it was like a 36, 36 or 72 hour cycle of misinformation until the facts were made clear. Thank well. you. Thank you so much, Cody. I'm going to pose just one last question in the interest of time. And this is, can be for anyone on the panel. But I do want to take a moment to mention that this question has been posed by Dalia al Aqidi, who is the executive director of the nonprofit, the American Center for Counter Extremism a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy, and most important, she is currently running against Ilhan Omar in the U.S. Congress. So because she's a political candidate, her question is, how do we change the status quo politically? I'll be very quick. So I think the best way to challenge the status quo is to not be afraid to stand up and to speak out, especially against the mob mentality. But I also think it's very important right now, especially in Canadian politics, to look at foreign policy. Look at which leaders are speaking out unequivocally against terrorism. Look at which leaders are speaking out unequivocally against the Islamic regime in Iran. And look at which leaders are not. Look at which leaders are trying to negotiate with them or try to justify their existence. Iranians, we've been trying for years to put the IRGC, the, the Islamic, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, on the Canadian terror list, and yet Justin Trudeau still refuses to, to put them on the terror list. And I don't know why. It makes no sense to me. I think that in and of itself will say a lot about Canadian policy and the Canadian political spectrum, especially given that Canada has become a safe haven for the terrorist Islamic regime in Iran. And one thing that no one is talking about, I'm going to leave this as a final thought, is that the RCMP just a few weeks ago confirmed that they have reports that the Islamic regime in Iran is engaging in foreign interference in Canada. But because everyone is focused on Israel and Hamas, that news was missed. So I'm just going to leave that as your final thought. Thank, Thank you. you. May I ask Sophie to come up and make some closing remarks? It's another quote by Hannah Arndt. And it says, Evil can spread like fungus over the surface of the earth and lay waste to the entire world. Evil comes from a failure to think. We wanted to drive the point home that our universities and our schools are producing a generation of marchers rather than thinkers. Marchers and screamers and sloganeers 
I want you to take what you heard here tonight, turn it over in your mind. Get out of the mindset that this is their problem. You've heard from the panelists here. This is a here problem. You saw the photos and the videos. It's here. Muslim Brotherhood is here. The IRGC is here. Imagine what your life would look like if this takes root. Raheel's advocacy centers on three E's. Expose the indiscriminate nature of terrorism and follow the money to reveal funding and indoctrination networks in the West. That's the IRGC. Empower those working to preserve liberal democracy and arm them with appropriate advocacy tools. Educate Canadians about the dangers of radicalization and terrorism that are imported from abroad and take root in the West. Use your voice and your vote. They operate here. They funnel money there. And they are costing us our education system. So I encourage you to write your MP, write your MPP, and push them to declare the IRGC a terrorist group. It's a crucial link in the spread of radical ideology, both in the Middle East and in the West. Write to your school trustees, your alma maters, and standard bearers in the media. Demand that our educational curricula, media, and public discourse respect Canadian laws that ban glorifying and equivocating around hate. Support teachers and professors who are getting canceled every day for working to root education in history and facts rather than personal truths. And demand accountability from police, politicians, and educators to take positions that aren't just convenient and popular and pleasant, but ones that keep all Canadians safe now and into the future. Thank you so much.